Hello, I'm glad to see you on my channel. We tell you about the history of the soldiers who took part in the Second World War. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. In Denmark, there was an abundance of almost everything, all peacetime foodstuffs, meat and cheese, coffee and cocoa, cakes and whipped cream. Our recruits, accustomed to the monotonous and already then inadequate food supply of the army, greedily gorged themselves on the rare delicacies. As a result, the first cases of jaundice were soon reported. The training of the entire division lasted almost two months. During this time, a reconnaissance center was formed from the commanders of the units and given a special task. Some two years ago, we were playing out plans for a crossing of the channel. We were exercising how to land on the coast of England and establish a foothold. Now we were playing it all out in reverse order. We surveyed the Danish coast around Zogjurk to establish where the English might land a landing craft, imagined from where and how they might attack the pass, and outlined appropriate responses, each commander for a different kind of weapon. The results of our reconnaissance and suggestions were plotted on a large map, which in turn served as material for the design and construction of fortifications in the area. Now it would not have been too difficult for the British to land at a variety of points along the French, Dutch or Danish coast. Most of the German divisions were encamped in the east, but the British didn't turn up, and neither did the Americans. We were waiting for the landing of an amphibious assault, the Soviets were waiting for it too. After the training and maneuvers were completed, our division was transferred to a section of the front near Volkov, south of Leningrad. We took positions among the swamps, a stronghold, a swamp road, a stronghold. When we had to go from one stronghold to another on a motorbike or a car all-terrain vehicle on a lattice floor, it felt as if our brains were being shaken out of our skulls. The sappers had done an unimaginably difficult job of laying communication routes right through the swamps, which were also given loud-sounding names, Curve Stendum, Erica's Clearing, Joe Kim Stavastras. However, this did not make our stay in the swampy area, saturated with fever miasma and millions of mosquitoes, any more cozy. Soviet soldiers infiltrated our location at night, traveling between strongholds in inflatable boats, supplying and supporting the partisans. The enemy attacked us from the flanks and rear and made our lives hell. However, we did not come to Volkov to have a holiday. We took up a circular defense, expecting a blow from all sides. With great difficulty we managed to pull up the guns to individual strongholds and camouflage them. We could not dig the guns into the ground. Covered with branches, they stood on lattices of logs. The mire was squelching, Frogs were croaking and mosquitoes were ringing, and clouds of mosquitoes swarmed over our heads in the stifling air. In such an atmosphere of utter desolation, the soldiers and officers were more and more persistently pursued by the fatal question. Why? Why is all this necessary? The questions were avoided with the help of vodka, which was considered to be the best preventive measure against swamp fever. In any case, it was constantly referred to near Volkov. It seemed that there were only two possibilities, either to get sick or to get used to rinsing one's mouth with vodka morning and evening. It remained a mystery to me how the Russians managed to bring their heavy guns into the very depths of the swamp and from their positions in a new direction each time, suddenly unleash a devastating fire on us. In such terrain where, judging by the map, a man could not reach, the guns would suddenly appear in the morning and bombard the strongholds and the pole planking, blocking the supply routes. More often than not, they disappeared before our artillery or aviation could hit these targets. The Red Army soldiers, apparently on their hands carried heavy guns through the mire, carried each shell and each shell box separately. It was unheard of hard labor, but otherwise one could not imagine how they succeeded in their operations again and again. We were even glad when we were transferred to positions near Leningrad. However, we were caught out of the fire and into the fire. Our positions were near Mulga and Sinyavin. 
the soldiers of the division we replaced were obviously happy to be leaving this section of the front. To our surprise, the very shift passed quietly, but the very next day the heavens fell upon us. True, we were prepared for this, as we had noticed depressions and craters of the size that occur when aerial bombs burst. It was nothing like that. Those were artillery shells of the largest caliber. The heavy suitcases passed by with such a rumble as an underground train pulls out of a tunnel at full speed. One shell was enough to lift a wooden house into the air, and it disappeared once and for all. A direct hit on our bunker squeezed and crushed the four-slope log deck in much the same way that I, as a boy, used to trample a mound of earth over a molehole in passing. A single crater in the road forced our vehicles to make a diversion across a plowed field until the sappers or construction battalions filled the hole. Our artillery was not left in the lurch. Large-caliber railway gun emplacements were placed behind our forward positions, which, constantly changing location, pelted the town with shells. At least we were dispersed over the terrain or in shelters underground, while the inhabitants of Leningrad suffered grievously from the shelling. Red Army positions were located on the outskirts or suburbs of the city. From there, forays were made with the strength of a battalion or regiment. They often succeeded in breaking through our positions, and only at the cost of great effort could we equalize the front or cut off the broken through units. In view of such attempts of the Russians to break the encirclement, we had to form resistance nodes on our part, so we were moved in different directions, as on a chessboard. In this connection, the command ordered the commanders of the units to familiarize themselves with those parts of the front which were not under their command. Thus, we once examined the positions near Peterhof. Standing at the command post at the broken tram tracks, I looked through binoculars along the rails with a peculiar feeling, looking at the outskirts of Leningrad. It was possible to spot a tank factory on the edge of the city. There, under the continuous fire of German artillery, T-34s were being repaired and new tanks were being made. With the help of a good stereo telescope, one could even see the movement in the factory and along the streets of the city. Everything was so close at hand, but next to the welding machine and steel drills were rifles and machine guns, also very close at hand. Every citizen of Leningrad was fighting for every stone. A few weeks later, a Russian large reconnaissance detachment managed to cut deeply into our location, but the group that broke through was surrounded by us. We even managed to re-establish a front line behind the breakthrough unit of about a hundred men. The Red Army men were in a hopeless position. True, they were well armed and had plenty of ammunition. Nevertheless, all their attempts to withdraw were foiled by fire from our side. Still they did not think of surrendering. The Russians fought desperately, dying one by one, until there was only a small band of wounded men left who held on to the hill literally to the last cartridge. When not a single shot was heard anymore, the German soldiers, firing with automatic rifles, crawled towards the wounded Red Army soldiers. Between the wounded lay the commander of the unit, a grey-haired major. Looking intently at the approaching German soldiers, he did not respond to their demand to surrender. He only looked at them steadfastly and shouted something in Russian. But the German soldiers did not understand him. Suddenly, an explosion lifted him slightly above the surface of the ground. Then he fell down on his back. He killed himself with the last grenade. We gave him a proper burial. Almost everyone who witnessed the incident, and those who later heard about it, each in their own way, but quite sincerely spoke with praise and admiration about the Soviet officer. Under the impression of this heroic deed, I also involuntarily became less susceptible to the anti-Soviet views indoctrinated in us. But I had not yet been prompted to deeper reflection by this incident. I had the impression at that time that the Red Army was fighting more persistently and purposefully, and that now, in comparison with the previous year, its combat operations, both reconnaissance and the operations of many divisions, 
were thoroughly thought out and better planned. If now the Red Army was forced to make a withdrawal, it was done for tactical reasons. In the first year of the war sometimes, there were still cases when groups of surrounded Red Army soldiers after a short battle stopped fighting, but now everyone fought to the last bullet. They fought even more fiercely than the border guards in the first weeks of the war. True, we sometimes still took prisoners. Most of them looked at us with fierce hatred. Some asked bluntly why we had attacked their country, and there were many who stated emphatically that we would lose the war. The same meaning must have been given to the words that a Soviet major shouted to the German soldiers as he was dying. Undoubtedly, it was not the offended ego of an officer who wanted to avoid the shame of capture that spoke in him, but the conviction that his country was fighting for the right cause and the consciousness of such moral superiority that gave him the strength to fight to the end and go to his death. Many signs indicated that a Soviet offensive was imminent. Our reconnaissance had spotted the Russian withdrawal to the original lines. At night, we heard the rumble of engines and rumbling tracks of tanks concentrating on our area. Increasingly, reconnaissance detachments were probing our positions, and various sorties were clearly intended to capture German prisoners. At any rate, we had to be comprehensively prepared. For this purpose meetings of officers were repeatedly convened in the division. The three infantry regiments of the division demanded that the sappers lay new minefields to strengthen the defence belt, that the artillery barrage area be redefined, and that, in addition, it had to second an additional number of observers to the infantry units to provide increased support from anti-tank and self-propelled artillery guns. Observer pilots were requested through course command to tell bombers, and particularly dive bombers, where to drop their bombs over the detected enemy's initial area of advance. It was also necessary to ensure that the infantry would be supported by air support in the event of an attack. One meeting followed another. The nervousness was increasing every day. A pre-threat atmosphere prevailed. I cannot claim that these meetings were conducted carelessly or that the measures taken as a result were superficial. Everything seemed right under the circumstances. But I did not like the manner and approach with which the expected losses were assessed. In the end, it was not only a question of whether we could hold our positions, but also of human lives. However, this side of the matter was discussed as if we were on a training ground in Germany and we were discussing the future course of manoeuvres, after which the winners and losers would meet in a casino over a bottle of champagne and allow themselves to be criticised. I was not happy with the whole style of the 23rd Division. This unit was attached to the Potsdam garrison. Its officers were supplied by the old Prussian nobility. The 9th Infantry Regiment was usually called the Count 9 Regiment, because almost all the officers there were counts or barons, and those from other classes were a tiny minority. Up to that time, I had seldom come across an officer of noble birth who could serve as a model as a commander and a man, but I met many extremely arrogant types for whom the soldiers were merely numbers in a company or battalion strength report. In the 23rd Division such arrogance prevailed. At the officers' meetings near Leningrad I, apart from one colonel still of the Kaiser school, was the only officer from the middle class, and no one like me advanced from the ranks. This was made clear to me. I did not suffer from an inferiority complex. On the contrary, I was proud of the fact that I had not become a captain because of my surname or origin. When, as a field officer, I taught the ABCs of military science to candidates for reserve officers, I had learnt with sufficient clarity how unintelligent the representatives of old families could sometimes be. But here I was annoyed that the other participants of the meeting, commanders like me, treated me as a second-class officer. When it was my turn to report the situation from the point of view of the anti-tank unit, I heard one of the commanders, a colonel, remark, Well, Let's see how Baron Windsor imagines the task of his unit. Of course, I flared with anger when I heard this mocking remark. 
my indignation was not only caused by the word barren, but also by the fact that such important matters were being discussed with inappropriate invectives, which were intended to remind me of what a great honor it was to be able to express my opinion in such an illustrious circle. I remembered the gray-haired Soviet major, whose cradle probably stood in some hut. I have also remembered my training in numerous courses, and that it had not been easy for me to obtain officers' epaulettes. For a moment, I thought of saluting and leaving the meeting. Herr Colonel, I said, and refrained from mentioning the title Count, which pleased him. Herr Colonel, I have mapped out the plan of action of my thirty-six guns. I ask you to check it. As for the title Baron, Herr Colonel has made a mistake. The Baron is my servant who cleans my boots every day. I am sorry I had to give him such duties, but he's not fit to be made a non-commissioned officer. True, it was not all true. There was not a single Baron in my unit, but it hit the mark. From then on I was treated with exquisitely cold politeness. After this episode, I became so disgusted with members of the nobility that I was often inclined to unjust generalizations because of it. Another officer of non-nobility who took part in the meeting was Colonel Devitz, commander of an infantry division. One of my companies was operating in his sector. Shortly before the expected advance of the enemy we agreed to meet, for this purpose, I went to his command post, where I asked the adjutant to report my arrival. The colonel's bunker was divided into two rooms by a tarpaulin hanging from the ceiling. In the front part, the adjutant usually sat at the telephone. In the inner room the colonel was seated. The furnishings were simple. A wooden bed of birch boards, the table for cards, two chests which served as chairs, and another telephone set. The front room was similarly furnished. On the walls of the bunker hung cloaks, clipboards, and binoculars, and in a corner were leaning against the wall the automatons of the liaisons and clerks. One of them was on duty in place of the adjutant, who took the opportunity of drinking brandy with my adjutant in the neighboring bunker to our good cooperation. While they were emptying the bottle, I waited for the colonel to invite me to join him. This lasted for quite a long time. When a shell burst near the command post, the panes of the small window moved from a peasant's hut through which the dim light penetrated into the shelter shook. Sound was falling through the beams onto the maps, tables and chairs. A machine gun began to whistle. Three or four bursts of mortar fire were heard. Then here and there bullets whistled, and again an artillery shell burst, and the sound flowed again. I was still waiting at the front of the bunker. Suddenly, machine guns rang out from all sides. Very close by, we heard a volley of our mortars shelling the enemy positions, and as if in response, there were explosions of mines on our side. Then there was silence. Then I heard soldiers running past the command post calling for a doctor. We reckoned every moment with the possibility of a strong attack on our positions. Always when the machine guns, mortars, and in the interval, the field artillery gave their concert, we could assume that it was an overture to the attack, and when such an intermezzo ceased, we sighed with relief. Whether I wanted to or not, I listened to the colonel in the next room dictating to his clerk. It was a letter to some lawyer back home. Gradually, I caught the meaning of the letter. The colonel came from the von Devitz family. Apparently some ancestor of his had lost his title of nobility or had drunk or sold it. At any rate, the lateral line of the family was now called simply Devitz, not von Devitz. The colonel obviously suffered from an inferiority complex due to the fact that the division had many representatives of ancient families. He did not need the title of nobility because he was recognized as a good military commander. Whatever his motives, it seems to me that he should have found out his ancestry as far back as Adam and Eve. But I was deeply disappointed that just now, when his soldiers were fighting a few hundred meters away, wounded or falling in battle, he found nothing better to do than wage a paper war for the title of nobility. He himself was evidently not at all embarrassed by the fact that I knew the contents of all this writing. 
He invited me to his office, apologized that he had to divert himself for a few seconds to reread the letter he had dictated, and finally turned to the subject of our meeting, which was now absolutely urgent, for the Soviet attack could begin at any moment, between the front and the motherland. A certain major proy arrived from the land forces personnel department to whom I was to hand over the division, as I had been allocated to attend a course for future regimental commanders. By the abundant luggage, white linen, and a new cap, I could judge how he imagined life on the front line. He immediately disliked the fact that I did not wear suede gloves in violation of all sorts of regulations. He ordered the adjutant of the division to button the collar of his coat, and thundered and thundered at the liaison officer when he scratched himself as he prepared to stand at attention. I explained to the gentleman from the personnel department, The soldiers have lice, Mr. Major. I'm sorry, what? We unfortunately have lice, and the bunker has bedbugs. That's wild peeishness, sir. Haven't you done anything about it? I can see I'll have to take care of the cleanliness here first. This is unheard of. He began his official activity by issuing an order to the division, according to which every soldier was obliged to wash and change his underwear several times a day. Company commanders were assigned to supervise this procedure and were asked to report in three days on the absolute absence of lice in the entrusted unit. The order came, but no report followed. There was no water on the front line, and if anyone shaved, he used some of his tea or coffee to do so. Lice were nailed to the nail, but they had the ability to leave behind abundant offspring. Lice can withstand extreme cold and do not drown when the shirt is submerged in water. Only frying or a special powder could get rid of them, and that only if the powder was suitable for use. On the third day, I removed a louse from the major's collar. The adjutant was absorbed in studying the map. The clerk, as if choking on something, ran out of the bunker, and the major blushed to the roots of his hair. It was reported that he finally reconciled. At the regimental commander's course at the Tankerdrum in Wunsdorf near Berlin gathered about a hundred officers from the armies and CG troops, captains, majors, and a few obolutements. During the first week, there were to be tank regiment exercises. Then we were to go for three days to Putlow's in Holstein, where we were to be shown the latest guns and tanks and the firing of live shells. After that, we were to take a course at the École Militaire in Paris. On the way to Putlow's I read the newspaper, Felkischer Biobacter. As always of late, the Wormap summary reported successful defensive battles in the East. Then my eyes fell on an article about a trial. A German woman who had lost her honor had had an affair with a Polish prisoner of war. This was considered a grave offense against the rules of morality, public ethics, and the law. The girl was sentenced to several years in a camp and the Pole was sentenced to death at the end of the week before being sent to. Putlow's, I went to Berlin once more to buy some things for myself in the small officer's department store at the Army's clothing department. I had to make a change at the Papierstrasse railway station. I walked along the platform. At the very end, armed SS men were on guard. Down between the rails men were working on balancing the tracks. They threw rubble with shovels without raising their shaved heads. On their skinny bodies hung striped jackets and trousers, and on their feet were wooden shoes. Whoever they were, prisoners from jail or concentration camps, criminals or communists, social democrats or other politicians. I still found it normal at that time that people who had committed certain offences against our order should make amends, because we were the ones who put our heads under bullets at the front. At that time, I did not know that these people, when they could no longer be used as labor force, ended their lives in gas chambers. They were exterminated because they wanted to exterminate their race or eradicate their worldview. Although there were rumors about this now and then, I didn't believe it. The common formula seemed more plausible. Died of exhaustion. I lit a cigarette and met the gaze of one of the stripes, 
who seemed to mentally reproduce my every movement, I realized they probably weren't getting tobacco rations. Impulsively, I had done something that I certainly would not have dared to do on sober reflection. It was not some kind of demonstration, but a manifestation of the pure smoker's solidarity that I was familiar with from the front. I dropped the merely full packet of cigarettes at my feet, made sure that no one was watching, and with the toe of my boot, pushed the packet over the edge of the platform. It was now lying by the prisoner's shovel. With lightning quickness, he picked it up and shoved it away without looking at me, then glanced at me for a split second, no gleam in his eyes, no smile, no sign of approval. Experience and caution had evidently not permitted it, and yet a sad expression of gratitude flashed in his gaze. Perhaps I seemed more pitiful to him in my Nazi officer's uniform than he did to me in his striped jacket. I stepped aside to speak to the sentry. The SS man would surely be able to tell me what these men were guilty of. Don't mind him, Herr Capitan. Each of them has his own sin on his conscience. They're all political criminals. Parasites, Herr Capitan, parasites. The SS man was probably in his twenties. Each of the prisoners was old enough to be his father, and some of them his grandfathers. The arrival of the train saved me from having to answer or ask new questions. At the signal of the railwayman's horn the prisoners stepped aside, doubtless glad of the little respite. I entered the carriage of a city railway train. At the Friedrichstrasse railway station, I bought myself a new packet of cigarettes. The few days in Puplos passed quickly. In the middle of May 1943, a special train was to take us to Paris. First we travelled towards Hamburg. Looking at the purple sky, we could guess that the city was on fire. The closer we got, the brighter the glow became, and the more clearly we could see the pearly chains of bursting light anti-aircraft artillery shells, the explosions of 88mm grenades, the glowing parachute bombs dropped by American and British attack bombers, and the lightning explosions of brazen shells slowly descending to the ground. The city was ablaze on all sides, a ghastly sight. Many of us in peacetime knew Hamburg as a flourishing city. We were overcome with impotent anger. We saw that our anti-aircraft artillery and night fighters were clearly unable to affect the enemy, and we knew that in the Hanseatic city were women and children. Rotterdam, however, was not mentioned, nor did I think about the fate of the people in London. The train stopped several times and then was diverted to another track. The next day in the evening we arrived in Paris and settled in a hotel. We spent two sultry months in the French capital of which we had dreamed, but which we had hardly seen during our training. We crammed instructions, listened to reports, watched films, exchanged experiences, and had regiments and divisions, march on a sandbox or on a map. For each command and staff exercise, we were given the situation the day before and had to develop and put in writing our assessment of the situation, suggestions and orders. Introducing new factors as the command and staff games progressed tested our ability to make correct decisions quickly. Our further use depended on the overall assessment at the end of the course. Everyone wanted to qualify as a regimental commander to achieve as much success as possible. After all, the results determined the entire future career. On this ground, a fierce competitive struggle was played out, and the intensified training gave rise to a kind of psychosis. In addition, there were disagreements between Wehrmacht and SS officers. In the free time we had left, there were heated arguments in the hotel bar. In the command and staff games, unlike at the front, we had full-strength units. We used such types of weapons, which we rarely had at the front, if at all. We laid mines and shot ammunition in such huge quantities, which could never have been delivered to us in the East, because the partisans were blowing up military trains. In every staff game the blue side won. The red side always managed to beat us. We created illusions for ourselves. I never had to participate in command and staff games that were close to reality. 
I also do not remember a single case when during the course of the staff games any participant, not excluding me, protested. For example, in this form, Herr Kermel, this is pure nonsense. In reality, my battalion would now have only two companies, and each of them would not have 150 soldiers, but at best 50. Everyone took part in the game, albeit with secret reservations, but without open objections. However, in the evening in the bar over Champagne and Cognac, we shared memories and thoughts. Here it was discovered that the officer corps was divided, that it was overcome by doubts. Here the truth was told. So it sometimes seemed like a devilish metamorphosis when these same officers sat with glowing faces after they had heard Hitler or Goebbels speak on the radio, a real schizophrenia. I knew the flaws. I did not agree with many things, but I believed in the ultimate victory. The SS officers impressed me, and I was not the only one with their confidence and determination. But at the same time we had a negative attitude towards them, because they did not speak our language, they had their own terminology and different criteria than we did. For example, it was simply incomprehensible to me that an SS officer, when talking about a combat operation, would describe his own losses as if the capture of a height was only worth mentioning if it involved a sufficiently large number of dead and wounded. I had a conversation about this with a Sturmbanfra of the SS Viking Division. He said to me, You approach things too schoolboyishly. For Wehrmacht officers, war is the realization of what they have studied for years. They call it the art of war. For us, the war in the East is an ideological campaign. We are convinced of our superiority over the Russians and all Slavs, and in the consciousness of this we get down to business. Those of us who have sacrificed ourselves serve as an example for us. After all, you are also a national socialist, so you know what I mean, don't you? He could have refrained from setting a primitive trap for me, but this technique prompted me to argue, though not in the realm of ideology. I was still very far from it. I objected. We consider it an injustice and a psychological error that the SS troops have an advantage in armaments and supplies. When you get into a cauldron, this is particularly striking. The SS division received winter camouflage waistcoats long before we even dared to think about anything like that. Himmler even made sure that the Est had got special food for Christmas while we were still eating horse meat soup. Such things annoy us and the soldiers. But we are the elite. We're better supplied because we're expected to excel. Hasn't it ever struck you that whenever things go wrong, SS divisions are thrown in to straighten things out? Naturally, but there is nothing extraordinary about it. The same thing could be achieved with the help of an army division, if it is properly equipped given the latest tanks and guns, and provided with ammunition in abundance. In this you are probably right, but the soldiers of CG troops are characterized by a very special enthusiasm. Everyone knows what that's all about, because our guys embody the spirit that the forer expects from his soldiers. Let me make one more remark, Sturmbannführer. I was in the cauldron next to the Est troops, I had to be in close cooperation with your anti-tank units. You had the same guns as us, and five men in a formation. But you had selected men. Each of them could fulfill the duties of a non-commissioned officer and even an officer. You had them expended as soldiers, and we had not enough replacements for non-commissioned officers. My dear, you'll think I misheard the word wasted. Our soldiers are of a different nature. They are all members of the Hitler Youth Union and prefer to be soldiers in the SS than non-commissioned officers in some division of the Wehrmacht. We are and remain a chosen part of the people. It was impossible to find common ground with this SS man. He did not want to or could not understand my arguments. I had to be careful. A hard-headed SS officer like that could have denounced a Wehrmacht camaraderie in no time. Was it worth the risk of spoiling the few free hours I had by getting into fruitless arguments? Paris is a beautiful city. But in the hot summer months, 
Parisians leave the city and leave in droves for the provinces or the sea. In this deserted, hot city, we travelled in the morning on a bus from our hotel to the École Militaire, from where we were taken to lunch, then back again. We crammed until evening. After dinner we would prepare our lessons. The day ended with a walk, but it was no relief. The streets were scorching hot. At lunchtime, I would give up the bus journey and walk the ten minutes to the hotel. In doing so, I had to walk across the bridge over the Seine, where a floating bathing house was anchored. Water from the Seine flowed through a chlorinating filter and filled the pool, which was surrounded on three sides by cabins. On the fourth side was a small café from which one could watch the bathers sitting under umbrellas. The bathing area was always crowded and it was impossible to get a wardrobe or changing cubicle. I approached the man on duty, a man of about thirty years of age, and spoke to him in what I thought was French, endeavouring to state my request. He waved his hand tiredly. You can speak German, Captain. It quickly became apparent that his German was as good as my French, but still we understood each other. I offered him one of those strong black French cigarettes, which Parisians then willingly smoked but seldom got. I need a locked cabin every day at twelve o'clock, only for half an hour. Can you help me with that? It's difficult, Miss Officer. You know what's done here, don't you? All you have to do is reserve a booth that can be arranged. That's the form we bargained in. My lunchtime was over and I hadn't eaten or bathed. The next day I made another attempt, but again without success. We stood at the edge of the pool smoking cigarettes, he in his swimming costume, me in my military uniform. I was drenched in sweat. Finally, after endless conversations, I found out that he would get in trouble with his colleagues if he granted my wish. So here's the deal. I gave him cigarettes for the other bathhouse employees and left. On the third day, things were still not going well. Then a salutary idea occurred to me. First I praised Paris, then France, then the French. Then I told him that the war between Germany and France had been a great misfortune, and that I was glad I did not belong to the occupation forces. What are you doing in Paris, Captain? I came from near Leningrad, and I am undergoing a course of training here. In two months, I'm due to leave again for the Eastern Front. Suddenly, everything was sorted out. I immediately received a cabin. Soon I was already swimming briskly in the Seine. When I came out of the water, I was greeted by all four of the bathing house clerks. We heard that you had just arrived from Russia, Captain. How are things going there? Dozens of other questions showed me that I have been given a cabin not only because the French are hostile to the soldiers of the Army of Occupation, and I was not one of them, but chiefly because of the intense interest of the French in the progress of the war in the East. It was noticeable that the French harbored the hope that the Soviet Union would inflict a final defeat on the German Wehrmacht. From that day onwards, I visited the little bathing establishment on the Seine regularly, every afternoon, got my cabin, smoked black cigarettes with Pierre, that was the name of my acquaintance, swam a few hundred meters back and forth and refreshed, returned to duty. We, Pierre and I, greeted each other like good friends. He smiled already from afar at my appearance. One day I asked him, Did you take part in the war, Pierre? Were you a soldier? He looked at me fearfully and asked a counter-question. Why do you want to know that, Captain? Oh, no reason, Pierre, because I was here myself at the time. Well, I can tell you, Captain. I was a soldier, even a non-commissioned officer. When I was captured, I ended up near Cologne. But I escaped from there. You see, I escaped from there. I couldn't do otherwise. Homesickness, as the Germans say. You escaped from captivity, Pierre? Is that what you're telling me? He looked at me in bewilderment. Pierre, as a German officer, I should have reported what you told me. You would have been sent back to the camp near Cologne. There's no way you'll do that, Captain. How can you be sure of that, Pierre? Who would reserve a cabin for you every day, 
and what's the point of you snitching on me? He shrugged his shoulders and waved his hands carelessly, as if to reinforce his words, but he clearly did not want to assure me that he did not consider all German officers to be snitches. After this conversation we became friends. Thanks to Pierre, I got an idea of the mood of the French. One day he asked me bluntly, Captain, do you go out in the evening? Very seldom, Pierre. There's nothing of interest anywhere, and besides, the heat bothers me. You always go swimming alone. But you shouldn't go out alone in the evening. Why not? Nobody can do anything to me. Yes, of course, but it'd be better. Believe me, please. He made his point quite definitely. Of course, the commandant's office had already warned us not to walk alone in uniform if possible, at least when it was dark and away from busy streets. We had not taken this warning very seriously, but still I was grateful to Pierre for his advice. Now we were talking to each other quite frankly. Captain, Germany has lost the war. No, Pierre, we'll win it. We'll win it, of course. You lost a whole army at Stalingrad, and the Wehrmacht keeps retreating. Nevertheless, we'll win. The retreat is necessary to shorten the front line. Why doesn't Hitler cut the front line at once, but always defeats first and then cuts back? Pierre, you can't pull entire armies back overnight. It would undermine supplies, and it's already disorganized by the partisans, Captain. But what about Rommel? Is that also a reduction of the front? Pierre even allowed himself an irony. On 13 May, two months before our conversation, the African Corps ceased to exist. Pierre was right, but I didn't have to admit it. We'll keep fighting and we'll win this war. If we lost it, not only the Germans would suffer, but the French as well. The Russians won't stop at the Rhine, and France will become communist. Pierre shrugged his shoulder again and spread his hands. What to do? We must wait. But before that, Germany would lose the war. That was an opinion he held firmly, and he was apparently not too frightened that France could become a communist country. The impressions of my conversation with Pierre did not leave a deep impression on me. I thought of him as an overconfident Frenchman who clung stubbornly to illusions. Nevertheless, I chatted with him willingly, if only to talk to someone other than the officers. The only amusement among the monotonous duties was the parties organized by the course commanders. Near our hotel there was a unit of lightning girls, as they called the signalers in army uniforms. Someone at the course took care to invite to the table as our ladies an appropriate number of liaison girls, who were more or less willing to attend these evenings. These isolated girls were no better off than we were. They were bored in their spare time and suffered from the heat. They were shunned by the Parisians in the same way as any other members of the occupation army. Usually, at the beginning of the evening, the homeland was recalled and folk songs were sung in chorus with the participation of everyone at the table. This was followed by stories of heroic deeds. The girls wanted to know exactly why they had received this or that badge of honor. Orders became a measure of courage. Among the lightning girls, there were many who wanted to return to normal living conditions to wear civilian dress. Military service was not to their liking, and they joined the army only to avoid labor conscription in the war factories. They accepted our invitations to talk to new people or out of politeness. Some left the parties early, others stayed. Then things got noisy, and as the number of bottles emptied increased, so did the self-righteous boasting about the impending ultimate victory. However, the clamor and drunken shouting could not drown out the anxious moves that were already making themselves felt in the subconscious. It was difficult to express these feelings, no one talked about them, but they eventually led to the fact that the party took on the character of an orgy on a volcano. It was not without reason that even then it was being repeated more and more often. Guys, enjoy the war. The world will be terrible. Men turned into males, women became females, and the hotel turned into a brothel. Then came a nasty hangover, 
and the military flag of the great German Reich on the roof of the building hung like a rag in the dense pre-dawn fog. Our studies of the course were coming to an end. On one of the last days Pierre asked me, Captain, must you go back to Russia? Of course, not only must I, but I want to. Good heavens, why should I? They need soldiers there. After a moment's silence, and looking at me thoughtfully, Pierre continued, You shouldn't go to the front. You are young, and life is beautiful. For what and for whom will you go to your death? I am the same age as you, Captain. I may have to fight again, who knows? But I don't want both my sons to ever fight. If I had sons, Pierre, I'd wish the same for them. But for peace to come at last, I must fight. Then I added, But why did it occur to you that you might be fighting again? He answered evasively. The German army suffered a heavy defeat at Kursk. The Americans and British have landed in Sicily and will conquer Italy. Hitler should have ended the war. He had already lost it in Russia. Pierre was aware of the events. The newspapers had not yet reported anything about Kursk and the Allied landing. Undoubtedly, the source of his information was London Radio. Maybe he belonged to the resistance too. I didn't know anything about the latest developments. But I replied to Pierre, You're right, things are bad. But that's why I must return to the army. Wouldn't you, as a Frenchman, do the same thing? As a Frenchman, yes, but as a German, for Hitler's sake, no. Those were cruel and frank words. But for me then, Hitler was still inseparable from Germany. Pierre continued, You will die in Russia. I found nothing better than to laugh. And Pierre shook his head as if he wanted to say, You Germans are stupid after all. On Saturday, at six o'clock in the morning, our echelon was to leave Paris. I had passed the tests at the end of the course, and I was to report to the 19th Tank Division, near Kiev, as the commander of a division of self-propelled artillery guns. On Saturday night, there was again an air alert. The British bombed the Orly Aerodrome and some factories on the outskirts of the city. But our train pulled away from the station platform at precisely six o'clock, in the bend of the Dnieper. Under the fire of British bombers, I left Paris and under the fire of American bombers arrived in Braunschweig. The way lay through the rural region with thousands of smoking ruins. This alone made a depressing impression. After the air raid had been cancelled, I asked the commandant's office to provide me with accommodation near the railway station. I was given a room in a hotel, which already accommodated three officers. The next morning, I went to the manning department of the 19th Anti-Tank Division for briefing and to receive my uniform. From that time on I was to wear a short tanker tunic instead of a French coat. With a new travel order, I went to the location of my division, which I had to find somewhere near Kiev. In Krakow, the regular train service was coming to an end. I had the opportunity only a few hours later to continue my journey in one of the holiday echelons. Thus, I had enough time to inquire at the railway office about the whereabouts of my brother Willie's bureau. Soon I was on the phone to him. Can you come to the railway station? There will be a short stop here. I have to go on to Kiev. I hope you'll stay with me tonight. I'm sorry, but it's impossible. Please come to the station. I can't tell you everything on the phone. I'll try to come as soon as possible. We met in the waiting room for a cup of coffee of such quality that it was a shame about the cup in which it was served. My brother stated offhandedly that I was out of my mind. Mate, I've got real coffee and vodka at home. You'll get a decent meal, get a good night's sleep and move on tomorrow. I'm sorry, Willie, but I've got to report to division. What a load of rubbish you're talking. You have no idea what's going on here. We're losing several locomotives and dozens of wagons every day. You could be on the tracks for a day or more. No one will blame you if you roll in there later. They'll be glad you came at all. He tried his best to talk me into it. We both don't know how things are going to turn out, Willie said. Think of Stalingrad. 
Maybe this is the last time we'll see each other. So stay. I didn't stay. I was proud of my promotion and looked forward to participating in the fighting of the tank division. I knew that the unit to which I had belonged since my transfer order had been handed to me was fighting, and I wanted to get there as soon as possible. On the way, I immediately realized that my brother had told me the truth. The train was idle now and then for hours, for the partisans had blown up the track. On the opposite tracks, there were sanitary trains full of wounded. Echelon commanders, soldiers of convoy teams, railwaymen and field gendums were frantically running back and forth between the tracks and fussing with the excitedly gesticulating Hungarian soldiers guarding the railway tracks. They were all shouting, swearing, asking each other questions and trying to outshout each other. At last the locomotive whistled, the attendants jumped up on the steps, the carriage doors slammed shut, and the train moved slowly on again, leaving behind it a thick black cloud of smoke and snorting like some beast of prehistoric times. Further on we had to drive through endless forests, from which the partisans might at any moment attack us. We were told on the way that the front was in motion again. Would I be able to get to Kiev at all? On the last night of this tedious journey, I suddenly fell on my neighbor. Things that had fallen from the luggage racks hit me on the lower back. Shards of the broken window scattered all over the compartment. The train had struck a mine. Outside there was impenetrable darkness. There were alarmed voices, shrill whistles. At last a white flare went up, and at once a machine gun started up. It might have been the machine gun of the convoy team traveling behind the locomotive on the open platform, but it might also have been the German machine gun with which the partisans were firing at the train. They now had plenty of captured weapons. In a wild panic everyone jumped out of the carriages, stumbling and sliding on the rubble of the railway embankment, falling one over the other near the tracks into the ferns, nettles and bushes of Drosera, an indiscriminate firing started. In front of us loomed a dark forest into which no one dared to penetrate. We were shooting through the woods. We could hear the branches breaking off and falling to the ground. It was an ominous forest, a refuge of the partisans. It answered our shots with a thousandfold echo, which, gradually dying down, sounded like a gloating infernal laughter. There was a sudden fearful silence. Then we heard the footsteps and cries of the wounded, the voice of the head of the echelon giving orders, the clanging and clanking of weapons. Slowly, cautiously we rose, gathered in groups near the tracks, and then one by one began to return to the wagons. It was all over. The result, six dead, eleven wounded, and a train delayed for more than four hours until a platoon of sappers rushed in to repair the track. Patrols that scoured the woods on both sides of the track found no trace of the enemy. Those were the partisans of whom Pierre had spoken in the little bathing house on the Seine. How many times had the Western powers debated about opening a second front? How many times it had been postponed? But the partisans in the Soviet Union had long ago solved the problem in their own way. At last we reached our goal. Having passed the suburbs at low speed, the train entered the ruined railway station. Kiev was the first Soviet city in which I found myself. Apart from a few hours in Riga and the panorama of Leningrad through a stereo tube, Kiev was the only Soviet city I had ever seen. A small tram, rumbling and swaying from side to side, took me to the army distribution center. Hundreds of soldiers of all ranks and arms, stragglers, furloughed, sick and wounded, crowded in front of the building. Each of them searched for his division, got a note in his traveling order confirming that he had tried to find his unit here, received his allowance and went on. If even here, the stragglers could not be told where their division was, they either had to wait some more for an answer, or they were assigned to other units. Obviously, east of the Dnieper, everything was going to pieces, no one was able to get a clear picture of the situation. By chance I met a major with whom I was previously acquainted. 
The red stripes on his trousers indicated that he was an officer of the general staff. The major served in the court headquarters and was waiting for the arrival of an echelon of officers from the reserve command staff. He had to send them to his court. From him I learned that in this section of Army Group South compounds are withdrawing to the defensive line on the west bank of the Dnieper. Most of the divisions were moving through Kiev. If you are lucky, the Major told me you will still meet the 19th Tank Division here in the city. Do you think we will be able to hold the Dnieper line? I hope so. But we have not found any fortified positions anywhere on the western bank of the Dnieper, and we have been told so much about them. It is as if fortifications and dugouts had been prepared there but so far we have seen only a few lines of trenches and nothing more. Besides, the Russians have apparently crossed the river in many places and established their bridgeheads, so the situation for us is very sad. What about Kiev? When can the Russians come here? We have leveled everything to the ground there, on the other side of the Dnieper. Our sappers have done a thorough job. There is not a single village left there. We took the inhabitants and cattle with us. All roads, bridges and railway lines are completely destroyed. Even the crops have been burned. Perhaps this will delay the Russians, perhaps not. It must be reckoned with every minute that Ivan will come out from around the corner. It's amazing how these people manage to outmaneuver us time and time again. We can't get away from them. For weeks now, we've had no peace. That story scared me. I had never been part of a retreat until then. I couldn't help but wonder why it had come to this. But in those days I was occupied only with a sober question. What is the practical sense of such measures, if they cannot stop the enemy? I did not think about the legality or illegality of these villainous operations. I was much more concerned with the fate of my unit than with the fate of the long-suffering Russian people. All this was new to me. Near Leningrad, when I was there, a breakthrough several kilometers wide was already a sensational event. He obviously needed other scales. For orientation, it was necessary to calculate the situation on more than one map of military operations. Otherwise, it was impossible to be aware of current events, and the Wehrmacht here spread out in all directions. I learned that my division had passed through Kiev two days earlier, and was fighting in the Dnieper, bend about a hundred kilometers to the south. No one could give more precise information. Together with a few soldiers who were also looking for the 19th Panzer Division, I climbed onto a lorry so overloaded with boxes and tools that the springs creaked menacingly. We left Kiev in the direction of Zhitome. After hours of driving, we arrived in a village at the entrance to which identification signs pointed the way to the Corps' command post. Here it was confirmed that my division had taken up positions south of Kiev in order to throw back the enemy units that had crossed the Dnieper. I wanted to get there in time to take part in the offensive. However, the area was dominated by partisans and dropped parachutists, so it was possible to go only with a convoy. We had to wait half a day until a large transport convoy was formed and set off under the protection of tanks and armoured personnel carriers repaired in the court workshops. Once on the way we were fired at from machine guns, but we paid no attention to it and drove on at the highest possible speed. It seemed that one felt safer at the front than in the rear. I introduced myself at the division headquarters, where I really wasn't expected yet. I couldn't help but think of Krako and my brother, of vodka and a clean bed. But I was very proud when the division commander, Colonel Kellner, said, I'm glad you found us so quickly. Three days ago we didn't even know we'd be here. In the division commander's staff bus, unit commanders gathered to discuss the battle plan. It was a real fashion show. Black and grey tunics, overcoats and leather waistcoats, grey shirts and black ties, bright silk scarves and shawls, black berets and caps of all kinds, galifes and boots, ski trousers and laced boots. Everyone wore what they wanted or what they had. Everyone was dressed differently. 
Also different were the ways and techniques by which each of the meeting participants presented their cartographic material. One carelessly pulled a map from behind the shank of his boot and another from under the cuff of his sleeve. One brought maps in a clipboard and another very carefully pinned the maps with buttons to a folding board. Before the meeting began, the colonel ordered large glasses to be filled with brandy. He had not seen the commanders of the units for many days. Next followed reports on the numerical composition of regiments and units. Regiments reduced to the list composition of the battalion. Of the surviving tanks, almost half were in the rear. It was necessary to repair them first. The 19th Panzer Division was formerly known as a victorious compound but now it was used up in many dangerous areas, and from it remained only pitiful remnants. At once a not very convincing combat order was drawn up. The positions of the enemy who had crossed the river were drawn on the maps in red pencil. The Dnieper formed a bend here, protruding eastward beyond our defensive line. This peninsula was a good pre-bridge fortification. Four divisions were concentrated to dislodge the enemy from these positions, and push him back to the other side of the river. Blue arrows on the map marked the direction of our attack. The colonel sensed that we didn't approve of his plan. What's the matter? He asked. The matter is shit, Mr. Colonel. How so? As soon as we get into this loop, the enemy's artillery will wipe us out. He's got a foothold all along the beach. Air Death reports there's not much artillery. The Russians have thrown all their forces at the bridge fortification, and they're still weak on the flanks. The Russians are making a massive offensive on Kiev. Nevertheless, I think the prospects are bad unless our neighbors have more rollers than we do. And how many chests do you have? Seven, Mr. Colonel. Four more chests will probably arrive today from the repair shops. This was the spirit of the conversation between the division commander who was sipping brandy, and one of the regimental commanders who had his hand carelessly in his pocket. By rollers and chests we meant tanks, and air death we called a reconnaissance aircraft. What a mess, I thought, and compared this swaggering tone with the situation at the command and staff games in Paris. The division commander, who invariably walked with a crutch, was in one of the regiments during the fighting, and the regimental commanders in their tanks participated in the attack. All of them came out of cavalry units of the First World War or from the Reichswehr cavalry, from which were formed the most maneuverable units of the Wehrmacht. Two officers and the divisional doctor were already waiting for me at the unit headquarters. Earlier I had summoned to the division the commander of the first company, who temporarily commanded the unit, and together with him went to the command post. The chief of staff, in turn, briefed me on the situation, but his information differed from the company commander's report. My adjutant could not explain the reason for the contradictions. When I was introduced to the divisional doctor, Dar Haberman, I asked him what was the condition of the personnel. He gave me clear answers, named the exact number of fallen in battle, wounded and sick. Then, coming closer, he asked permission to inform me more about the situation. The young doctor was awarded two iron crosses, had a patch for wounding and a decoration for destroying a tank. Please, doctor, if you wish. In short, concise phrases, he outlined the situation, showed me on a map the positions of all three companies, or rather, their remnants, called companies. He knew how many self-propelled guns there were and how many of these guns without chassis drew a fairly accurate picture of the ammunition situation, told me what other vehicles were in readiness. I was surprised, but the other officers were apparently already used to the fact that the doctor is so well versed in the situation. I said to him, You're more of a chief of staff than a doctor. I'm both. Our commander's been killed. He always took me with him, and left the chief of staff at the command post. I'd appreciate it if you'd do the same. But you, doctor, have a completely different job. The wounded have to be taken care of on the front line. The rest will be done at the division medical station. 
Our company paramedics are experienced men. Tar Haberman was always with me. He became more than just a chaperone for me, especially because I felt like a stranger in this division. It consisted almost entirely of people from Lower Saxony. In addition, they were all old tankers, whereas I had come from the poor infantry. Finally, they were such hardened nices that it disgusted even me, although I still considered myself a national socialist. However, the commander of our division, a native of East Prussia, was already critical of many things. When, shortly after my arrival, he celebrated his promotion to Major General with us, he forgot to raise a glass to the health of the Führer and Supreme Commander of the Wehrmacht. However, we failed to eliminate the Soviet pre-bridge fortification. The attack began at exactly six o'clock in the morning with a fire attack of our artillery. Then came in motion four divisions. We successfully advanced, especially after several squadrons of bombers suppressed the enemy's artillery and planes rained down on clusters of his tanks. The Red Army formations withdrew to the Dnieper, and they made skillful use of the deep precipitous ravines called here gullies. About noon I, together with my liaisons, was on a small elevation, from where I could already see the ribbon of the river gleaming in the distance. Directly beside me a young lieutenant was adjusting the fire of his battery. A shell would whistle over our heads, and only then would a shot be heard and almost at the same second, the sound of bursting was heard. The Russian resistance became more stubborn. The Dnieper was under our noses, but we could no longer advance. An hour later, Major General Kellner appeared. In the meantime, the telephone cable was pulled up, and he contacted by telephone with his division, with the neighboring formations, and with the court headquarters. From the individual phrases that reached me, I caught, that he wanted to agree with the commanders of the other three divisions about our offensive. His proposals were reported to the court headquarters, and he was waiting for a reply. We were also waiting. In the meantime, the artillery was hitting new targets, the tanks were advancing to new starting points. The drivers took advantage of the opportune moment to refuel their vehicles, and the infantry lay down in the grass. Finally the order came. Since everything is going smoothly, it is necessary to immediately withdraw two divisions from the battle and move them on a march to Kiev. The remaining divisions, including the 19th Panzer Division, clear the pre-bridge fortification. The General Pale shouted into the telephone receiver, Just now I asked for more air support and to transfer an additional number of tanks from the Corps to reserve. We ourselves are unable to advance. How can we continue the offensive, giving two divisions? From the court headquarters, confirmed the order to attack. The general objected. But it's hopeless. We're doubling the width of the offensive line. From the court headquarters, again replied, carry out the order. The general asked for two divisions to be withdrawn after the attack. But this request was refused, explaining that these divisions were urgently needed. The Russians had broken through elsewhere. Besides, it was an order from the Führer. Major General Kellner hung up the telephone. At the same moment, a corrective command of an artillery lieutenant sounded beside us. It became clear the Russians had advanced.